Yes? No. So the guys in the front can't, so maybe you should just sit back, Berwin, you know. So. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so there's a, you know, this is heavy stuff, I guess, right, for, for many of us. And I, I'm aware of that, you know, but, but what I wanted to try you is that you can get on top of some heavy stuff by some, using some simple geometric intuition. Now, the question is, you know, what, what, what do we use this heavy stuff for? You know, why, why is it that we go into all this trouble and you could say, well, you know, Marcus, he's a mathematician, you know, that's what he does for a living, you know, he has to do that to earn his bread, right? But why should, why should we do this too? Sorry? Uh, you're, you're getting feedback in the microphone. If you can turn on the volume a little bit, otherwise it will... No, on, on the main panel. Okay. Um, yeah, otherwise it will get lost. Yeah, I've screamed too loud. Huh? So, yeah, is that okay? Yeah. So is it better? Can you still... Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so why, why should we know about all this stuff? Well, let's go back again to our exponential families here, you know, this formula here. And remember, in the beginning I said what we would like to do, we would like to approximate this thing in here. Right? We would like to get some approximations, some formulas. We want to compute you know, basically this scalar product, or maybe this theta. So now, how does this formula fit in with our kernels and our Gaussian processes and our Hilbert spaces? Well, this here, the scalar product is just the scalar product in our Hilbert space. The theta is an element of our Hilbert space, you know, and the phi of x is basically our, our reproducing kernel. So that's, you know, that's how you can, how you can get back. Um, and I think that's, that's really one of the motivations why to do this. So, so there, was a few, there were a few questions in the break. And one question is, you know, I still don't get it. Why was the uh, null space or the orthogonal complement of the null space, why was the dimension of that 1 or 0? Right? I showed the proof. I think the key point there is to observe you know, that's the case because our functionals are real functionals. So they map our space onto a one-dimensional space. And there the orthogonal complement, even in five dimensions, is going to be, you know, one-dimensional at most. So that's, that's the answer to that, the simple answer to that. If it's not the, the zero, yeah. So, so, yes, yes, yes. Yes, that's right. And basically, I think that's what I sort of yeah. tried to do. Then you could say, okay, then there's a third question is, well, you know, with these Hilbert spaces, that's all nice and good, but what about some examples? What about some examples? Okay, so how do you get, how do you get such a, a Hilbert space here? Well, so one way to construct the elements in there is to look at linear combinations of uh, functions f of x which are linear combinations ci of k of xi of x i equals 1 to n so right so we just look at linear combinations of these things this gives us uh, you know in fact, you know, we, we, we vary over n, we vary over C, the ci's, gives us a linear space, it's infinite dimensional, and the scalar products here, in here we define by the scalar products on our generating elements, k of xi and k of xj, equals k of xi and xj, or which is the same as k of xi evaluated at xj. Right. So that's how we can get so that's how we can get our you know one function space. So if we know that if we have a Gaussian process our given covariance matrix 
we look at linear combinations of these things and get our functions, then you say, well, Marcus, this is not a Hilbert space. It's not. No, it's not. And why isn't it? Well, it's, it's not complete. So what you need to do, you need to take the completion. So what you have, you have a linear space. With this here, you have a scalar product. So you have a topology and a metric. So you can take the completion of that space. And that gives you the that gives you a first example based on your covariance matrix. But you know what what are these functions really? What are these functions? So in some sense these functions are smooth, right? But so what I want to show you is, a, is another example. I'll show you another example. Uh, and that's the, the example which is used in partial differential equations is the, the so called are the so called uh, Sobolev spaces, which are named after the uh, Russian uh, mathematician Sobolev. And I look at functions in one dimension. So from, say for example, from 0, 1 to R, right? We look at real functions. And we, we define our scalar product, Fg. Remember our original scalar product with a 0 here is something like f of x times g of x dx from 0 and 1. That just gives us L2, right? Gives us the so-called L2 space of, of square integral functions on the interval 0, 1. Now, if we add here a term where we integrate just the derivatives as well, we get the Sobolev space, which is, which is often called uh, H1 on uh, 0, 1. Sorry? Yes, so, so that's right. So, so the thing here is that, that you know, this, this wouldn't exist for any L2 function. So, we, we, uh, so there is you know, some mathematical uh, uh, reasoning which uh, goes to show how you construct this in, in practice, but basically, you know, you look at functions where the derivative is L2 as well. The first derivative is L2. And in this case, you can actually show that the function value of uh, f of x is bounded by some constant times this Sobolev norm. And this constant here is called the uh, Sobolev constant, unsurprisingly, right? or the embedding constant. Uh, so, uh, so this is another example. Now you could say, what about, you know, what about higher dimensional things? What about if we take you know, sort of the d-dimensional unit cube and look at functions there? Can we still do the same thing here? Well, the answer to that is that yes, we can do that, but we need to take higher derivatives. Because if we take this norm here, we would still get the uh, Hilbert space, but the function values would not be continuous anymore, uh, a continuous function of the, of the, uh, in that space of the, of the function, of, of the element of the Hilbert space. So in that case, you know, we need to go to higher and higher order derivatives. And so for, for very high uh, dimensional spaces, so for example, for a 100 dimensional space, we need to go to 50 order, 50th order derivatives. You could say, you know, that's crazy. In some cases, it's actually maybe feasible. But I, I think I won't go into that anymore. But however, you can show that in these cases, there are kernels. To, uh, to compute this. And the thing is, the, all the computations I think Vichy and Alex will be talking about are based on these, these kernels. Right? Our approximations are basically, what we do is we base them on the, on the scalar products. So there's a, you know, there's a slight change. And you know, we're still, uh, I guess we still need to dis discuss with uh, Alex and Vichy a bit more on how we sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, join these two approaches together. So that answers, hopefully, some of the questions. Yes? Uh, still, I have a problem. Uh, so when you're talking about completion, 
Yes. What norm are you are you using? Okay. So yes. Good good question. I'll answer the question. So what we have here, we have a space, right? Defined by these linear finite linear combinations, right? That's fine. That's a linear space, right? On that space, so uh, sorry, so the yeah, so the question was, maybe I should repeat that for the audience. The question was, what I talked about the completion here before, and the question was, with respect to which norm do we do the completion? And so we have a linear space here defined by this here, and in that linear space, we define a scalar product. So how do we define a scalar product? We define the scalar product of all our generating elements here. And this is, this is how we define this. So we assume that k of xi, xj is given. This kernel is given, right? There are conditions on this kernel, and you know, I think Vichy might talk about those a little bit. But, uh, but so, so uh, let's assume that, that the kernel is such that it defines a scalar product on this space here, right? And then the scale, a scalar product defines a metric and a norm in the usual way, right? So the norm, if you have a scalar product, is defined by the uh, scalar product of an elephant with itself and the square root of that, right? So that gives you the norm, right? And, uh, and with respect to that norm, we do the completion. Sounds circular. Uh, no, I mean, the problem is still to show that this reproducing property holds for the... Uh, for the in yes. The, because it, it obviously holds for any element of your space, but in very many. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, I think, yeah. There's still more, more we should do, but I think I'll leave that out for the moment, if that's okay. Okay, so now let's see, where do we go? Okay, so now, let's get back to our old problem again. This is what we're interested to compute. So we want to compute this thing here, right? So k of x was the vector of the uh, values of our kernels at our data points, kx1 to kxn, and the value at the point x, so this is a vector, depending on x, transpose times this here, these are all numbers, right? These are our coefficients. So basically, if we look at this here, these are the coefficients here, and the vector is just this thing here, right? So that's what this is. And we need to compute the coefficients in this way, or we could compute the coefficients in this way. So now we can actually rewrite this here as a, a solution of a penalized least squares problem. Remember, we sort of shied away from computing this because of the matrix being very large, especially in data mining applications, and dense. And so we need to solve this thing here, right? And we, we note that our f, of course, is in our space h1, and is the minimizer of this minimization problem here. Now this is a proposition, and we need to prove it, right? So why is that the case? And the, the case, again, is what we do, we go to the Galerkin equations. So if you, you know, I hope you remember reproducing kernels and all, all that nice stuff and Gaussian process, you get to repeat it tomorrow. But one thing I really want you to remember is the name Galerkin. So this is the numerical analyst, numerical computing. This is all about you know, Galerkin. So what we do, and that, those are the variational equations. So if we do, if we look at minimizing this here, so how, how do we go about this in variational calculus? Well, we say, okay, at the minimum, we take a slight variation of this g. So we add a little something onto g, something small, right? And if we, if we have a, a, minimum, a local minimum, right? If we add something small on, you know, that would be the value there of this functional here, this would be, would be larger, 
right? And so that's what we use, and from that we get straight away to the Galerkin equations. Or, I mean, this is a sort of a weak way of writing that the gradient of this here with respect to g, so now we're taking actually the derivative with respect to a function is zero at the minimum, right? So that's what these Galerkin equations mean, so that's why we have something which is zero on the right hand side. You can see that the norm squared shows up as this scalar product here, and here the squared, you know, we get some, some products here, here as well. And so now, of course, we remember that we have our reproducing kernel Hilbert space, so our g of xi equals k of xi and g. And see, this is where really the reproducing kernel Hilbert space comes in very prominently and importantly, is in the evaluation of these, uh, of these uh, uh, function values here. So we can write this as a scalar product, and so we have here a scalar product with g with this thing here times a k of xi and here a scalar product of g with, with f. So from this here, because this here is valid for all g, right, for any g, that's a consequence of, f, of our f being a minimizer of this functional here. This here has to hold for any g in our uh, Hilbert space. These are the Galerkin equations. From that we get, we get these equations here. And then, you know, we introduce uh, these numbers ci equal these things here, and then we get f equals ci of kxi from this here and this here. So this here is something which is also called the representative theorem, basically, right? And, you know, uh, while I showed this for a particular case here, a particular example, you get the same type of representative theorem, and in fact, I think Vichy will talk about the representative theorem in the case where we have more complicated situations than this here, in fact, nonlinear situations as well. So this is the representative theorem. So, so the, the solution to this minimization problem is a linear combination of our kernels, right? And then when we put this into our, uh, our equations, we get from that, we get, we get these equations here for the, for the coefficients. So that's, that's the proof that well, actually what we're minimizing this here. So if we want to do, you know, kernel methods without kernels, in a sense, right, you have to look at the underlying variational problems, right? And, you want to, and what you want to do, you want to solve those variational problems somehow. And so these are just a few comments by Gray Swaba in 2000 uh, in an interface uh, short course what was the state of the art, I guess, at that stage, which, uh, which with re uh, respect to reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. So, you know, the Partson and, and uh, later on in the 70s, there was some theoretical work done on, on reproducing kernels for Hilbert space. So this is actually sort of an old thing. I remember when I did my thesis in a long time ago, in 1987, right, there, my colleague, actually worked on reproducing kernel Hilbert space. He was in the same office as I, doing his PhD thesis on, on, uh, on, on relating to the work by Gray Swab, and I did meet Gray Swab at that stage, at some stage. Uh, but, uh, so we need high-speed computers to solve these large linear systems and equations. And I guess you know, there are problems and choosing smoothing parameters and things like that, and we need some user-friendly software. And so, but I think there's still, you know, there's still problems of having efficient codes and I think there's still some computational issues which still can be addressed. So this is where the finite element method comes in. So now, this, now, that, now we're going into towards the sparse grids. Now we're going into the area of the numerical analyst. So remember what we want to do, we want to solve variational problems. So we want to minimize some functional of a function, you know, some some function which of j of f, and this is a simple example, you know, and you'll see other examples from, from Vichy. We want to minimize things like this here. And you can see here, this is a, you know, this might relate to your prior here, for example, right? And this is the, you know, your uh, uh, likelihood. And what we want to compute, we want to actually compute our f here. And so what we do in our Galerkin approximations, 
we say, okay, now we don't want to go to the kernels. We don't want to find the minimizer in the whole reproducing kernel Hilbert space, but we'll take a subspace, a finite dimensional subspace, maybe a 10 dimensional subspace. We might know that you know, these functions are well approximated by this, these 10 parameters, right? And so what we do, we minimize this thing here instead of in our reproducing kernel Hilbert space, in our subspace. And then, of course, we have to, you know, we have a couple of questions. We have to know why is this any good, right? And we have to know uh, how, we, how we're going to do this, right? Well, uh, I'll talk a little bit about why is this any good, but I'll mostly talk about, you know, how we're going to do this. And so first of all, we, we're going to say, okay, let's, we're going to look at these Galerkin equations again. So these are the Galerkin equations. So these things have to hold. So remember, we want to compute F in our V, in our sp approximation space V. So this is the finite dimensional subspace, right? Uh, these equations have to hold for any G in V. Now this thing here is, here if we can control our finite dimensional subspace, we can control the complexity of this problem. You know, this is a big if, right? And this is what, what uh, you know, the, the main thesis of this talk is, that, well, sparse grids provide a good V. Right, that's the, the bottom line, I think. More generally, we would have to actually look at non, this is so-called conforming finite elements. We would, maybe in some cases, we would have to look at finite elements where our space V is not a subspace of H1. Often the H1 is very smooth, as maybe the function in H1 are too smooth for our uh, uh, space of functions V. So what, does, what do these uh, uh, yeah, okay. so what do these spaces look like? What does such a space V look like? So for example, we could look at in one dimension, we could look at piecewise linear functions. So we could look at, and this is the, the starting point. Uh, we could look at functions, you know, if we have a, an interval here. Instead of looking at smooth functions, we look at functions which are piecewise linear. And you can see here that these functions are uniquely de defined by a finite number of function values and are linearly uh, interpolated in between, right? So that's a reasonable function class for one-dimensional functions, right? Now the question is how do you do it in high dimensions, of course, but, but just keep thinking about this, this example for a moment. We'll talk more about this. Now if we do uh, these things, we can actually look at uh, you know, reproducing kernels in that subspace too. So more, more generally, we look at what we would really like to do in a sense, we would look at, like to do a projection from our H1 into our subspace V. So that would in some sense, in terms of our H1 norm, be the best approximation. So a projection is just like an orthogonal projection, it's the thing which is closest in terms of our H1 norm. So you can really think of it geometrically. But then the question is, you know, how do we compute this here? How do we compute this orthogonal projection? Well, we just use the Galerkin equations here again. So this is the thing where, where our projection, scalar product, product, uh, product with G equals the scalar product with our F. These things are well defined. And this here gives us a unique F of V out of our subspace V. And so we could, for example, represent that maybe as a linear combination of basis vectors. So, you know, if we want to do computations, we need basis functions of our, of our V. So, for example, we have hat functions in our piecewise linear functions. And we get a linear system of equations here. Uh, and here you can see the, you know, the, the, uh, the H1 scalar product should also be the H1 scalar product over here, too. And you can also define a, 
a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So actually, this five dimensional subspace is also a reproducing kernel Hilbert space with the same scalar product, but with a different kernel. And the kernel is actually just a projection of the kernel function into that subspace. And you can write f of x equals this here, which, of course, because f is in our subspace, f is uh, equal to the projection into the subspace because that's itself. And so we can move this over. Projections are self-adjoint operators. Remember they're joined from before. Now projections, they are things which you can actually move across and they're the same. Here, so they're self-adjoint orthogonal projections. And, uh, and here we just get the, this is sort of proof that we have the kernel in our subspace. Or another way of putting this, if we want to compute the function values for any function f in, v, in h, h1, we want to compute the function values of the projection in that subspace, we can actually use our kernel or our projected kernel of that subspace too. Well, okay, so now here we're going to define a third scalar product. We have two scalar products already, and you say, well, you know, I'm actually fed up, you know, I have this. We have the L2 scalar product, right, which is just the, the normal one, and then we have this H1 with the reproducing kernels, and now we're using a third one as well. So why, why do we need a third one? But you'll see in a, in a moment that using this third scalar product gives some nice uh, interpretation. So we, we define this here, scalar product as the old scalar product, maybe times some factor gamma here, plus this linear combination of function values, and these xi's are you know, any collection of points, or basically they would refer to our, our data points. And so now if our fx, that would be the exact solution of our penalized least squares problem, so that would be our regression estimator we have from before. Um, if that's the minimizer of that, then we can show that the difference of uh, the projection of this, sorry, of the minimizer in the subspace V, right, so the difference to the exact solution to the minimizer in Fe, so that this is the norm squared with respect to this new scalar product, is bounded from above by the norm here, where we take any uh, element of our five dimensional subspace here. So what does that mean? That means that with respect to our new scalar product, the minimizer or the, you know, the the MAP approximate in our subspace V is really the projection of our exact solution, our smoothing spline, it's sometimes also called, into this subspace. And you know, you can, you can show this, and I think I'll, I'll spare you this, this proof at this stage. It's, it's really fairly easy. But the thing is that really, so the, the uh, what our if we minimize in this five dimensional subspace, we really get a projection with respect to this scalar product uh, of, our, of our smoothing spline. You know, this, is a, this is a proof. Uh, basically what you can show is that uh, the J of F equals the J of the exact, so the smoothing spline, plus the norm in this new uh, uh, metric here squared of the, of the error. And we will use this uh, later on. However, you could say, well, now we have a new scalar product. What about the reproducing kernel with respect to this new scalar product? And how does it relate to the old reproducing kernel? Well, OK. So uh, if we look at, but you know, why, would, why would that actually be interesting? Why would be, we be interested in that at all? Well, the thing is here that um, if we look at the, our predictor here, remember the scalar product, uh, sorry, the, the Galerkin equations for our predictor F, which is the minimizer of our, or our smoothing spline, satisfies these Galerkin equations. 
So, so these were exactly the equations we had here. Um, let's see. Here, these equations. Because this here is basically just the, the new scalar product of G with F. Right, and then we have the sum on the right-hand side. So that's, that's how we characterize this here. So now if we take the reproducing kernel with respect to this new scalar product and, and uh, put it, uh, replace G by that reprodu new reproducing kernel, we get F of X equals, you know, of course, this here is the definition of the reproducing kernel. And uh, this is just, by, by this formula here, this linear combination of the values we're taking these function values here. So we have without, you know, if we know this, this uh, reproducing kernel of this new scalar product, we can write down the solution of our, of our regression problem straight away without having to solve any more equations. This would be handy, right? This would be handy. I mean, the question is, can it be done? Um, uh, now, of course, you know, there's, there's no free lunch even here. And uh, in order to compute this kernel, you would again, you know, have to solve some equations very similar to the ones we had uh, had before. And I think I, I won't I won't go into to any more detail here, but you know you know you you, you can use the uh, uh, you can use the Galerian equations, uh, and you represent our function value as a scalar product of this here with the one kernel and this scalar product, and the other kernel and the other scalar product, right? And then we, we solve this. Now, okay, so I have until one? One. One, okay, so I think Berwin told me I should really end at exactly one because he had some meeting, so I'll try to do that. Uh, but I think we should start now with the discretization and look at, you know, what types of approximations can we do? So we're looking at X being in the unit cube here, so x being a, a real vector with components between 0 and 1. Now we could take some other, other uh, set as well. But let's look at this here. And in one dimensional, what we do, we have piecewise linear functions. So we partition our set, our interval, into equal parts. And in each part, we have a linear function, right? In two dimension, we, we partition it like in this picture here, and in each little uh, sub, uh, uh, cube, we write our function as a bilinear function like this here, so we have the linear terms, and we have a product term here. Note here that this function is, is uh, at most uh, a first-order function in both variables. So it, we have a, a linear term here in x, a constant term in x1, sorry, a linear term in x1 and a constant. Yeah. And so and we, can do, we can generalize this to 3D and DD, uh, D dimensions, up to high dimensions if we want. And we, we ensure continuity by making sure that the function values at the grid points are the same for adjacent uh, sub uh, cubes. Piece by layer. Uh, we, have a we have a really very nice and fast evaluation. And you, know, we might, you might argue. Uh, about the interpretation of, of these terms, and I think we can sort of you know, uh, elaborate this point. But I think I think what we're we're not maybe so much interested in interpretation, but rather in the in the prediction here. So this is what we have in one dimensions. We have as basis function we have this hat functions, which is one at a certain grid point and zero at all the other grid points. So these are our b i of x. And our function x is a linear combination of these uh, grid points. And if we know the function values at the grid points, we get the interpolant straight away by this uh, simple formula. So how many of you have seen piecewise linear interpolants? So, th so uh, I think piecewise linear interpolants, for those who haven't seen them, I think they have been around since the Middle Ages. and. Uh, now, they have been used by, by high school, school kids, I think, to interpolate. At least at my time, we learned about uh, you know, logarithms and signs and so on. And if you wanted to compute the sign, we didn't have computers then. So what did you do? I mean, this is showing my age, of course. That's 
probably if we correlate, you know, the people knowing about piecewise linear interpolation and the age, we would see some correlation there. But, but you know, you, you look at these tables and you see, okay, my, my, my uh, x is between the two values there, so we, we have a function, you know, for 0.3 maybe and a, a tabulated value for 0.35, but we want to know, you know, the sign of 0.32. So what we do, we do, we do a linear interpolant between those things. So that's exactly what is used there. So uh, yeah, I'm sorry that this is not not taught anymore. I think I think this is actually a fairly useful skill. Besides uh, uh, learning about you know centuries of of uh, uh, mathematics, I think. Okay, so this is a piecewise linear. Then in a 2D case, we have the piecewise bilinear. So here we just have a, a product basis. So our basis functions here are basically just the products of the basis functions we had before. So, you know, just the products of the basis functions we had before. And you see here the dimension of our space, you know, is proportional to the number of grid points. So n1 is like... Uh, 2 to the n, 1 plus 1 is the number of grid points in, in one dimension, and this is the number of grid points in the other dimension. So we, we, we uh, recursively half our, our uh, grids. We do that in n d dimensions, so there we get tensor, so-called tensor products, or our basis functions are just products of the basis functions in each uh, dimension. The bottom line here is you know, these functions are very simple, very fast to evaluate. And in fact, the interpolant can be written right in the same way as we did it for the, uh, for the one-dimensional case. Because, so, so the reason why we could write our interpolants in a simple way in one dimensions was because our, you know, our, uh, our basis function was a so-called Lagrange function. Anyone heard about Lagrangian interpolation? Yes, yes, some, I guess, no, no. So La Lagrange, so there's, you know, in numerical analysis, there's Lagrange. And I remember, in the early days of computing, actually numerical analysis was taught to computer science students, right? I think, unfortunately, for, for us numerical analysts, that has stopped, I believe, right? So there's, there's, there's little numerical analysis Taught, but one thing which is which has been taught was was interpolation, and there's you know there's Newton interpolation, Lagrange interpolation. Lagrange interpolation uses basis functions, which are zero at all your interpolation points except for one interpolation point. Right? That's Lagrange interpolation. And then you can write the interpolation, the interpolant down very quickly, right? Because it's just the function value times at that point times the basis function plus the function value at uh, this point, you know, times the basis function, which is over here, and so on. So that's, that gives you a very nice representation, a very simple uh, uh, evaluation. So these things are Lagrange functions. The, uh, in two dimensions, that property remains. Because if you have a, you know, if you have a grid like, and can you see can you see my small drawings from the back there? Is that okay? Yeah, okay. So there we, we have a grid like this here. So here we have a, you know, a function which is one here and zero on all the other points. So it's basically a function which looks a little bit something maybe like, like, like this here, right? in a sense. It's like a, like a tent in a way. But of course, if you look at one line, it's, it's linear here, so it's, you know, it's a hat function here and it's a hat function here, but here it comes up like a, like a tent. But again, it is Lagrangian that it's, it's a function one, the base function is one at one uh, grip point and zero everywhere else. Okay, so now, how good are these things, right? And so there's a whole theory about how good these things are. Now, can you guys in the back see this writing here, though? Can you, can you see this in the... No, you can't. Huh? No? Can you see it? No? You, you can't. No, you can't. Okay. Yeah, so I'm sorry about this. Uh, this sort of... Uh, the <laughs> anyway, but you can see this formula here, right? 
So this is a bound on your error. So this is this, this error here at a certain point. This is in a, in a certain subinterval. So this is the one dimensional case. The error is bounded here. So it should be E of X at this point is bounded by this thing here. And this is the maximum value of the second derivative. So that's an important thing. We have an H squared, which is the, the, the size of the, your grid. And then we have this thing here, which is because it's a, it's a quadratic, uh, sorry, it's a, sorry, a linear interpolant between these two points here. So, so the error is going to be, you expect, you know, you get a quadratic bound here relating to the uh, second derivative. But the interesting thing is here is that, and this, this, I'm, I'm sorry that you can't see this, how you prove this is that there's a kernel coming in here as well. So there's a kernel and basically a second order subelef space norm. So, it's, so, there's, you know, it's a, so errors, again, relate to reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces too. And, and here you get, you get this kernel. And here I have a formula for this kernel, but I'm, I'm, for, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, you can't really see, see what this is. Um, <clears throat> but this is, so this is the, so this is a characteristic bound, and it, this, is, this is typical that we get this H squared dependence. Now, what if we go into higher dimensions? Into um, two dimensions? You know, we get a sort of a, a thing like this. Here we get this uh, bilinear approximation. But the important thing here just to notice is that here we have the grid size in one dimension in the first variable and the grid size in the second variable. And here the h's, they appear again as squares. So it's a second order approximation in two dimensions too. And in d dimensions, again, you know, we have sort of a general sum where we have these squares, the grid size occurs as a square. And that's important. So this is, this is the consequence of this error law. Yes, Marcus? Is there intuitive explanation why there are no mixed derivatives, but only second derivatives with respect to the axis? Um, that's a good question. Uh, the mixed things come in higher orders. The uh, uh, yeah, this is a, so. Maybe I should go back to the to the small writing here. So the thing is that. Uh, I mean, if, if, you, if you look at this here, you could actually say it to a, to a to first order. So this is the, the first terms. You can decouple the errors in, in, in the dimensions, basically. That's, that's what this says. Yeah. Because the, the this is a, I mean, this is, this is just a bound, right? Uh, See, the thing is that the mixed, the mixed terms would come in, but with higher order terms in H1 and H2, right? Because we only look at you know, H1 squared and H2 squared, right? We don't get any mixed terms. But if you go higher up, right, you would get mixed terms as well. Yes, please. How tight are these bonds? Um, well, uh, they're, they're exact for quadratic functions. So if you look at this here, right? If you take a, a quadratic function for f, these things are exact. So in this sense, they are tight. Now the thing is, of course, that, you know, I think the, the important question is here, you know, these uh, you know, these norms of second derivatives, how do they relate to our reproducing kernel Hilbert space? Right? And that's something, I think, which, which could be explored more. The, the thing is, the, the smoothness condition there, I think you would typically also write in terms of your reproducing kernel. And one way to write this as, is as a you know, applying your reproducing kernel as a, like in the case of the Green's function, multiple times. That gives you multi higher order smoothness assumptions. 
And there you could make a connection to, uh, to uh, this here. And I think I'm just about uh, going to finish here. Huh? Uh, where did we? Ah, yeah, this is, the, this is the last thing. So the thing is, so what this shows here is if we say that, okay, we have initially an error of one, right? So I normalize this to an error of one. What do these error laws tell us? How do we get the, uh, our, uh, how does our error reduce if we increase the size of our approximation space? Right. So because of the curse of dimensionality, the dimension of the space, and so we assume that in all, all directions we have the same number of grid points, grows like you know, 2 to the nd. Right? And the reduction in error is like h squared, so that's 4 to the minus n. And you can see here, so this here is the, the one-dimensional case, so that looks fine, you know. If we go from, uh, you know, if we have a thousand times finer grid, we get, you know, a million times smaller error, that's squared. Uh, but if we have a two, three, four, five-dimensional, if we want to have a, a million times better error, you know, we need to have a, a 10 times 17, I think, times as large a space to get that type of approximation. This is the one view of the curse of dimensionality. And this is why we need sparse grids. And sparse grids are what we're going to talk about uh, next week. Ah, next week, tomorrow, sorry. <laughs> <It's a> short week, <laughs> tomorrow. Okay, thank you.